Well, that's just part one. So we made a short film about the work that God has done in our friend Jules Glasgow's life. It's the story of her salvation, and we're going to show it in three parts. Part two is coming tomorrow night, and then part three is coming on Thursday night. And so we would love to have you back to watch the rest of that short film. But let me just ask you guys here tonight, how are we doing missions week night number one? Awesome. Let's go. Well, hey, we are so excited to be doing this. And uh, there are a lot of people who are serving this week full time to make these events happen. There are people who are getting here early to set up. There are people who will stay here late to tear down. And out of that set up and tear down crew, there is one job that is always typically my favorite to watch people, to watch people do it. And my favorite job to watch people do is the guys who stack chairs, the guys who carry the chairs. You know why? Because sometimes the bros take a little too many. And uh, I know one of the reasons why the bros take a little too many, because they're thinking the girls might be watching the bros taking a little too many. And they're like, yeah, no, I think I, could take, uh, I think I could take seven right now. And then you just watch the bro try to take seven chairs. And it's like, bro, you don't got this. And he's like, I, I, I got it. I, I got it. And he's, he's trying to take the chairs to where he's wanting to go. And, and, and honestly, guys, that's kind of almost like a little picture of my life, if I can just be real with you. I went through my life, and I was trying to carry all of these chairs. But let's say that these chairs represented different sins in my life. And I'm just going to be real with you guys here tonight. I don't have anything to fake. I don't have anything to present. I don't have anything to put on. I'm just here to tell you my story. I was a guy who grew up and at a very young age, I saw something that I should not have seen. And that awakened within me a desire for sexual immorality. And from a very young age, I was enslaved to the sin of lust looking at women in a way that I should not have and desiring them in my heart. And I thought, you know, oh, well, I can carry this on my own and I can, I can take that. And man, I was also someone who cussed like a sailor. I mean, not in front of my parents because I was a good church going kid. And so if I cussed in front of my parents, whew, I would have gotten a whooping if you know what I'm saying. So, uh, that's right. Yep. There it is. So uh, yeah, that was another sin in my life that I was trying to carry. And I was thinking, okay, I can do this on my own. And another big sin that defined my life was disobeying and disrespecting my parents, not giving them the honor that they deserved, not showing them the kind of respect that God wanted me to. And probably besides lust and sexual immorality, the biggest sin in my life was the sin of idolatry. You might be thinking, uh, what? Were you like, bowing down to statues and like foreign gods? What do you mean idolatry? No, I, I mean, I idolized surfing. My dad taught me how to surf when I was five years old and I got pretty good at it pretty quickly and I got sponsored and I started doing competitions and thought that I was going to go pro, even got to a semi-pro level and surfing was my life. It was all that I thought about. It was all that I wanted. It was my God. It was the number one thing that I worshiped in my heart. When I woke up in the morning, I wanted to go surfing. Throughout my day, I wanted to get back to the beach. At the end of the night, I was watching the surf movies. If I could choose God or surfing, just honestly, I would have chose surfing. It was an idol in my heart. And eventually, what ended up happening is as I was carrying around all of these sins, I was like, oh, dude, this is starting to get heavy. Oh, man, this is starting to feel like a burden. Wow, this is starting to feel like a lot for me to carry on my own. And eventually, I got to a spot where I was just like, I can't. I can't do this anymore. This is hard. This is difficult. Carrying my sin around on my own, it got exhausting. It got so burdensome. And I remember there was one night when I was a sophomore in high school, I was at an event, honestly, just like this. And I thought that I was a Christian. I thought that I was a good kid. I grew up going to church, and I tried to do the right thing, even though I had all of these sins going on in my life, and most of them were in secret, but they defined me. And I was at this event, and I was hearing about what Jesus has done for me. And I knew the story growing up. I was very familiar with it, being a church-going kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, he died on the cross for sins, and then they buried him in the ground, and then three days later, he rose from the grave. But just like Jules was sharing in that part of her testimony, we were talking about what it actually looks like to be a Christian, 
and how when God saves you, you are a new creation. Your old life of sin, it passes away and it dies and you don't continue on in it anymore. And your new life of living for Jesus, when God saves you, begins, and now you are a new person living a new way. And I'm hearing this, and I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, I don't think that's ever happened to me. I'm looking back at my life, and I'm thinking, I feel like I've pretty much always just lived the same old Shane way. Going to church, calling myself a Christian, but then living in sin. And God opened up my eyes to see I'm not a Christian. Jesus Christ has never truly saved me. I'm not living for him even though I've said that I am because when you live for Jesus, he changes everything about your life. And man, in that moment, I felt so burdened. The weight of my sin was so heavy and I was thinking to myself, what am I gonna do with all of this sin? And God opened up my eyes to see, I know what to do with all of this sin. I bring this sin to Jesus and he carries it for me because he died for my sin. And so I was a guy who tried to carry my sin on my own, but then God opened up my eyes to see, oh yeah, that sin of cussing, Jesus died for that sin of cussing. Oh yeah, that sin of disobeying my parents and not giving them the respect and the honor that they deserve, yeah, Jesus died for that sin of disobeying my parents. My sin of lust that defined everything about my life Jesus died for that so I can be set free and I can be pure and I don't have to continue on in that same sin and my sin of idolatry, of living for something more than God. Yeah, Jesus paid for that sin. Jesus carried my sin on the cross so that way I don't have to walk around with the burden of my sin anymore. I can be forgiven and I can be free. And when I put my faith and trust in Jesus... He completely and totally radically changed everything about my life. Here tonight, I want to ask you a very simple question. And the question that I want to ask you, and I hope here tonight that after this sermon is done, you'll even be willing to engage with a friend here tonight in a conversation about this question. Here's the question. You can write it down in your handout. You can type it into your phone if you're taking some notes. The question that I want to ask you here tonight is, who is carrying your sin? That's the question. I want you to think about that with me. And as you write that question down, as you think about that here tonight, I want to invite you to grab that Bible you've got and open it with me to Isaiah 52. The reason why we are calling this week the Good News Festival is because we are here tonight, tomorrow, and Thursday to talk about the greatest news that anybody could ever hear. It's called the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. And we're not going to look at a passage or a scripture in the New Testament where you might think about going when we talk about Jesus. No, we're here tonight to look at a passage in the Old Testament. We're going to look at a book called Isaiah. And we're going to look at Isaiah 52 through Isaiah 53. And the reason why is because this is a prophecy of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. I don't know if you know what a prophecy is, but a prophecy is when God tells the future before it happens. And prophecy is a reason why you should believe in Jesus as your needed substitute so your sins can be forgiven. I want to read this prophecy, and I'm going to actually ask everybody to do something here tonight, so that way we will give the scripture our full and undivided attention. Will you stand up with me for the public reading of God's word? And if you're having a hard time finding it, don't worry. We will throw the verses up here on the screen, but if you've got it, follow along with me in your Bible. This is Isaiah 52. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13 and then go all the way through chapter 53. It says this, "'Behold, my servant shall act wisely.'" He shall be high and lifted up, and he shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not understand they have heard. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied, and by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors." That's the reading of God's word. You can go ahead and have your seat. Thanks for doing that. Let's commit this to the Lord with a brief word of prayer, everybody. Father in heaven, we come before you here tonight, and God, we are about to study your word. This is the most important thing that we could ever do with our lives. God, people here tonight are not going to hear what I have to say. They're going to hear what you have to say. And so I pray that you would speak clearly and you would help us to pay attention, that we would put away every distraction and we would listen to your word as you speak it straight to our souls. Give us understanding and help us to receive it here tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know what you thought when you read that, Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, but as I said, this is a prophecy. And what this is so clearly describing is who Jesus is and what he did when he bore our sins on the cross. This is a prophecy of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do here tonight is I want to give you an Isaiah 53 prophecy timeline. We're going to throw it up here on the screen. we got a slide coming up, and you can write this down on your handout just to help you understand what we're talking about. That what we just read, Isaiah, was written 700 years B.C. Now, you might not know what B.C. stands for. When I say B.C., I'm talking about before Christ, before Jesus was born as a man. So Isaiah, what we just read, was written 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. And what we just read is very clearly talking about how Jesus died on the cross. Before Jesus ever died on the cross, Isaiah was telling us exactly how it was going to happen. This is such a powerful, mind-blowing example of prophecy. Unfortunately, though, many people still don't believe. Many people reject this prophecy. They hear it, and they think, nah. Other people, they don't just flat out reject it. They just choose not to believe in it. They're like, oh, okay, cool, that's interesting. Fun little fact. But yet they don't respond to it in a kind of a way where they put their faith and trust in Jesus and they give him all of their life. This is actually what Isaiah even said was going to happen. Look back at Isaiah 53, verse 1. He says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And when he asked that question right there, Who has believed what he has heard from us? The implied answer is, Many people don't. Even though this is such a clear and compelling example of prophecy that should make people believe, wow, look at Jesus. He died for me. I should put my faith in him and I should live for him. Isaiah is even saying, before it ever happened, even though this is how it will go down, still 
many people will not believe. Here's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 11. We'll throw this verse up on the screen. Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So Jesus Christ, he came on a seek and save mission when he was born as a man, and he had a specific target that he was going after, and the specific target was the Jews. And so when Jesus showed up, he was going after the Jews because they were God's chosen people, and he wanted to ransom them to himself. He wanted to save them, but the scripture even says many of his own people did not believe in him. And it was not just the Jews who chose not to believe. Here's what Romans 10 verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, and then he quotes from Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So Jesus was sent to the Jews, and the Jews didn't believe. They rejected him. Now Paul, here in Romans chapter 10, is quoting Isaiah 53, and he's saying, yeah, a lot of people. It's not just the Jews. A lot of people will hear about what Jesus has done for them, and still they will choose not to believe. And so this is something that I want you to think about. You could continue the timeline. The question that I want you to think about is, what is your response? Hearing this prophecy... Reading this prophecy, knowing this prophecy, how are you going to respond to what Jesus Christ has done for you? And specifically, I even want you to think about, if you're going to choose to reject it, do you understand that you are flat out rejecting very clear proof? This prophecy, it's so compelling. And I want to give you a, a thought here tonight. You can choose not to believe but someday you will see. Every single person here in this room, whether you would say you believe in Jesus and are living for him or not, every single person here tonight will someday see that Jesus Christ is the suffering servant who died on the cross for your sins and he's worthy of all of your life. Whether you choose to believe that now or even if you don't, still someday you will. Look at what it says, Isaiah 52. Look back at verse 13. It says, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and he shall be exalted. Did you see how that word shall was repeated three different times? And that word shall is actually in the future tense. And so what Isaiah even begins with here in this prophecy is, yeah, Jesus is going to go to the Jews and he's going to die on the cross for their sins. And many of them will not believe in him and many of them will reject him. But even though that happens, the servant will still be exalted. He will still be high and lifted up. And even those who reject will someday see that he is the one who is worthy of their life, even though some people will realize it too late. See, really, what Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 is actually truly a prophecy of is not just Jesus dying on the cross 700 years later. This is actually a prophecy of something that still has not happened. What the Bible teaches is that there's coming a day in the future, and we have no idea when it's going to be. It could be today. It could be next week. It could be 50 years from now. Jesus is coming back. That Jesus who died on the cross for you as a suffering servant, he's coming back someday, and he's not coming back as a suffering servant. He's coming back as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and anybody who is not on team Jesus, he is going to wipe out in judgment. Those who are his, he will save into glory, into heaven. And what Isaiah is actually a prophecy of is on that day when Jesus comes back, those Jews who rejected him will say Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. They will say, behold, he's the one. Yeah, we rejected him while we were alive, but now we see him. And what do we get? What do we understand? He's the exalted one. He is the one who is high and lifted up. If you don't believe me, here's another prophecy. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 says it like this and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that and then it goes on to say when they look on me on him whom they have pierced they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and they shall weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn 
Zechariah is prophesying that there's coming a day when those Jews who have rejected Jesus as their suffering servant, as their savior, will see him coming on the clouds. And on that day when they see him, they will mourn and they will weep. Why are they mourning and weeping? Because on that day, it's too late. If you're not living for Jesus now, and today's the day that he comes, when he comes, there's no second chances. That's the judgment. And Zechariah is prophesying that on that day, yeah, many people who rejected him are going to mourn, and they will say this prophecy right here. So let's complete the timeline. Not only do I want you to think about what is your response, I want you to understand that even those who reject will see. Even those who reject will see. And we're not just talking about the Jews. We're not just talking about them. Because Isaiah says in Isaiah 52, verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. So yes, the Jews who reject him, someday will see him and they will mourn and they will weep and they will understand he is the one. But it will be too late. But it's not just them. Isaiah says, even kings will someday see him. And on that day, kings, like the most powerful person that we could ever imagine or picture is the idea that Isaiah is giving us. Even them, the most powerful person, will shut their mouth. They won't be able to speak in his presence. They will have nothing to say because they'll get it. They'll realize he is the one. Write this down for point number one here tonight. You will see Jesus as the suffering servant. You will see Jesus as the suffering servant. And so let me ask you here tonight to consider, do some hard introspection, to kind of evaluate yourself here tonight. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the one who suffered on your behalf to take the place that you deserved to pay for all of your sins so that way you can be completely and totally forgiven, so that way you can be saved, and so that way you can have a relationship with him? See, if you've lived your life up until this moment choosing not to believe, choosing to reject Or even, you're like, man, I don't feel like I've chosen not to believe. I just feel like I've never really actually considered it this seriously, like you're presenting it before us here tonight. Hey, tonight is an opportunity for you to see Jesus as the suffering servant and put your faith in him before it is too late. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. We don't have these verses that we're going to throw up here on the screen. And so just real quick, I want everybody to turn there so that way you can see it with me. Psalm chapter 2. Here at our church, Compass Bible Church, we are reading through the Psalms together right now. Anybody out there reading through the Psalms here at Compass HB? Awesome. This is a great thing that we do. It's called Scripture of the Day. And I know we got a lot of new people joining us here tonight. Hey, we would love for you, if you don't already have a a solid Bible preaching, gospel teaching church that you are plugged into, to join us here, to come back tomorrow night and Thursday night, but to also start coming on the weekends, and you can read Scripture of the Day with us. Well, we're reading through the Psalms, and so we read Psalm chapter 2 a long time ago, but I want us to read it here tonight. It says this, beginning in verse 1, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Here's what the psalmist is saying. Hey, there are kings, powerful people, who are like, oh, I don't want to submit myself under the authority of the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? Jesus Christ. Here are powerful people understanding who Jesus is and knowing what he's done for them. And they're like, no, 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 no. I don't want to live for him. No, 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 no. I don't want to go that route. No, no, no. I'm not about that. That's what they're saying. And here's what happens. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Oh, all you kings who think that you're so mighty and powerful 
but yet not living for the king, Jesus Christ, hey, there's coming a day where you're going to see that king because the Father has established him. And I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Hey, if those kings who think that they're so mighty and so powerful do not believe in Jesus and give their lives to him and turn from their sins in repentance, on that day when Jesus comes, they will be destroyed. They will be wiped out. They will be judged. So what should they do? Verse 10, same exact thing that every one of us should do. It says this, now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. How should you respond? Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled and blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who find safety from his wrath in him and the place where wrath was already poured out on behalf of our sins. Now you might read that line where it says right there in verse 12, kiss the son, and you're like, hold up, what? Did the scripture just tell me to kiss Jesus? I mean, I'm not about that one, uh, especially since there's a lot of us here in the room who are dudes. I don't know how I feel about that one, right? What are we talking about? Kiss the son. Kissing Jesus? Even everybody, like, even if you're not a dude, it's like, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, he's Jesus. Kissing him? Like, ugh, just a weird thought, right? What does that mean to kiss the son? Here's what it means to kiss the son. The idea is when there was a king, someone who was in power, someone who was in authority, what would happen is other people would come before that king. And that king had the authority and the power to wipe that person out if that person was not a loyal, faithful servant of the king. And so to show the king that this person wanted to be a loyal, faithful servant of him, there would be like what we would call a pledge of allegiance that I am giving my life to you. I am, I'm surrendering to you. I am letting you have the rights. I'm letting you have the power, not just in general, but over me and my life. I will now live to serve you. And so what that person would do to show that and say that is that person would actually get down on one knee and the king would have this massive ring, like total flex. He would have this huge thing on his finger and he would stick out his hand and he would stick out his ring. And what you would do is you would kiss the ring. Maybe you've seen that in movies before, where the king puts out his hand and the loyal subjects, the servants, kiss the ring. That's this idea right here. Hey, Jesus, he's king. He's got all power. He's got all authority. Have you believed in him? Have you given your life to him? Are you living for him? Because if you're not, there's coming a day where he's going to come back, and he's not coming back as a suffering servant, humble and rejected. He's coming back as king of kings. And man, if you're not living for him, he's going to destroy in judgment those who are not living for him. And so we need to make sure here tonight that every single one of us have bowed the knee to King Jesus and pledged our lives in allegiance to him. That's what it means to believe in him. To believe in him does not just mean that you agree that he did this for you. To believe in him means that you give your life to him. He's not just king. He's king over me. I live to serve him. Is that true of you? Go back with me to Isaiah 53, and let's dive a little deeper into this prophecy for a couple of more minutes before we break up into our small groups and have some conversations here tonight. Isaiah 53, and look at what it says. Let's now jump to verse 2. Talking about Jesus, it says, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, he was rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So you might wonder, wow, if Jesus is this king then how come everybody doesn't live for him? How come there's so much sin all around us? How come there's so much hypocrisy all around us? People claiming to live for King Jesus, but then not actually living truly for him. If he's king, why aren't we all his servants? Well, the first time that Jesus came, 
He didn't come as a conquering king. He didn't show up on the scene and say, hey, everybody, I'm here to shut it down. No, when he showed up the first time, he was a very humble man, and many people rejected him and despised him. They rejected him and despised him so much so that at the end of his life, even though he had never done anything wrong, even though he never once had done any sin, he was brutally mistreated. And why was he done that? Why did that happen to him? I mean, look at even how brutal it was. Look back at Isaiah 52 and look at verse 14 now. It says in Isaiah 52, verse 14, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. See, here's what the scripture says, that when Jesus was beaten, mocked, tortured, and then ultimately nailed to a cross, he went through so much terrible physical suffering that by the time that he got up on that cross to hang there to die for our sins, when you looked at that man on a tree, he didn't look like a man. That's how bad the suffering was. He was a beaten, bloody mess. He didn't even look like a human. It's how bad what he experienced for you was. How many of you guys have seen that movie, Passion of the Christ? Some of us have seen that movie, Passion of the Christ, where it describes, it depicts what it was like when Jesus died on that cross. And it is a brutal showing of what Jesus went through for you when he died on the cross. And that movie doesn't even nearly do it justice. It doesn't even come close to how bad it actually was. See, what happened is they took Jesus, and first they put him on trial, and they falsely accused him of things that he never did. And they said that he was a liar, and they said that he was a blasphemer. They accused him of committing sins, even though he was the only person, like we'll learn tomorrow night, who never wants sin. The only man to ever live a perfect life. And then the Jews in the crowd, when he was on trial, got so fired up that they started shouting out at the top of their lungs, crucify him, crucify him, because they just wanted him dead. They just wanted him gone. And so Pilate... The guy who was in charge at that time, he said, okay, and he gave the order. And Jesus, he was now going to be crucified. But even before he got to that cross, they took him and they chained him to this little post where his hands would be stuck and they ripped all the clothes off of his back so that way he didn't have any clothes on and they got this whip and they started whipping his back and just beating him and just ripping open the skin and the flesh on his back so that way his back was exposed. And you could literally probably see the very bones in blood on the inside of him as they whipped him so severely. And then after they whipped him on that post, they unchained him, and he could barely get up, and they mocked him by putting a purple robe on him, which purple is the color of royalty because people would say he was the king of the Jews. And so they mocked him by doing that. And then they put this big, massive wooden cross on his back. And then they put this crown of thorns on his skull so that blood was protruding from his head. And with that crown of thorns and with this wooden cross, they made him march to a hill where they were going to nail him to this cross. And then they laid the cross down stretched out his arms, stretched out his legs, and right here with all these veins, and right here with all of this flesh, they put two nails to hang him on this cross. They put his feet together, and they put a big massive nail through his feet so that way he would hang there on that cross. And what would happen on that cross as you're hanging is you wouldn't be able to breathe you would die of this thing actually called asphyxiation. It's like drowning, where your lungs can't breathe because when you're hanging like this, the only way that you can breathe is you have to lift yourself up in order to get a breath. And so his back is open up against this wooden cross, and in order to even breathe, he was lifting himself up and scraping the open flesh on that wooden cross every single time. And he died there. And the Bible makes it very clear why that happened. I want you to see that that didn't just happen for no reason. That didn't just happen in general. 
Here's what the scripture says. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says this, Surely he has borne our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep, we've all sinned. We've all gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We're living for ourselves. We want to be the master. We want to be the king or queen of our own life. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The reason why Jesus did that was for you. You don't know him? You never met him? You never seen him? But a real man, don't be fooled just because it happened a long time ago, a real man who lived on this planet, walked, breathed, ate, died for you, for your sin. He shed his blood because your sin needs to be forgiven. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus shed his blood for you. He carried your sin so that way you can be saved. I want you to write this down for point number two here tonight. Trust that Jesus carried your sin. See, this is the response. The response to what Jesus has done for us is not to think, whoa, wait, what? He died for my sin, and I'm either going to die in my sin in judgment, or I'm going to trust in him. Oh, man. Okay, so I guess what I got to do is I guess I got I to gotta try to clean up myself. I got to stop. I got to try to stop doing my sin. Man, if Jesus died for my sin, well, I, I can't keep on doing it. No, that's not the response. The response is not you. Go try harder. The response is not you. Go do better. The response is not, hey, when you die, do you want to go to heaven? Okay, if you want to go to heaven, stop your sin. No, that's not the response. We can't do it. We're all like stupid sheep who have turned our own way, living for ourselves. What we need is we need to trust. (laughs) Jesus did it. He died for my sin. So that way I can be forgiven. And now I'm going to respond to what he has done for me by trusting in him. I'm not going to think anymore that being a good person, going to church, living the right way is what's going to get me into heaven when I die. No, instead, I'm going to think I can't do it. But Jesus did. And I want to ask you here tonight another question. And the question that I want to ask you here tonight, I guess this is the second question that we could talk about in our groups in a couple of minutes. The second question that I want you to think about is, do you know what it looks like to trust in Jesus? Do you know what that looks like? See, to trust in Jesus is not just to agree that Jesus lived and died for you. The Bible actually says that demons believe in Jesus. But they're not going to heaven They're not living for God. So there's a difference between trusting in Jesus for your salvation and knowing you're going to heaven when you die and agreeing with the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Those are two different things. So what does it look like to trust in Jesus? I want you to go with me in your Bibles to one last passage, 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you can't find it, we will have these verses up here on the screen. And so you could look up on the screen if you can't find it in your Bible. But if you can, go with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I just want you to see this one last verse before we sing one more worship song. And then we talk about this together in some small groups and just have some honest conversations about what we think about this talk here tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at what it says. Begin with me in verse 21. It says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And that's what we're talking about tomorrow night. You need to come back to learn more about that. But it says this right here in verse 24, and this is the answer to our first question. He himself bore, carried our sins 
in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then look, it quotes Isaiah 53, by his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So here, Peter is defining for us what it looks like and what it means to trust in Jesus. Jesus carried your sins. And why did he do that? So that way you can die to your sin and you can live to righteousness. So that way you can change. So that way you can be made new. And you don't change and be made new by trying harder on your own to do better so that way God will accept you. No, the way that you change, the only way that you can truly put your sin to death, which is what God requires, is through trusting in him. And there's a very important difference that we all have to understand here tonight. It's one thing to look at this cross and say, oh, wow, Jesus died for my lust. That's amazing. That's not trusting in Jesus. See, it it, it would be like this. Here's what it would be like. It would be like me taking this chair down from the cross and sitting right here in my lust and looking at the cross and being like, wow, Jesus died for my sin. Well, I'm still sitting in it. Well, I'm still doing it. Well, I'm still living in it. Well, it still defines my life. That's, That's not trust. That's not true faith. That's not what it really looks like to live for Jesus. Here's what it really looks like. Whoa. Jesus, Jesus died for my sin. Dude, I, I can't get out of this on my own. The only thing that I can do is bring my sin to Jesus and give it to him because he already died for it. And then I'm going to leave it with him. And I'm going to continue trusting in him. And now I'm going to walk away and I'm going to live for him because of what he's already done for me. I just want to ask you here tonight, have you trusted in Jesus? Have you put your faith and your confidence in what he did for you to forgive you of your sins, and has he made you new? Are you still sitting in your sin? Or are you living a new way for Jesus because he died on the cross for your sins. We're going to sing one more song of worship, but before we sing this song of worship, I want to make it really clear that we are so happy everybody is here tonight. And one thing we don't want anybody here tonight to feel is any pressure when we break up into these small groups, like you have to share what we might think is the right thing to say. No, I want to make it very clear here tonight, man, we're stoked that there's so many new people We're so excited you're here for the first time. And man, if you don't know that you've trusted in Jesus, if you're not sure that he is carrying your sins, don't feel like you need to say what you just think is the right thing to say. Just be honest. We're not here to judge you. We love you. We're so glad that you would be here tonight. We hope you keep on coming back. We hope you keep on learning more about this great God that we get to live for and we get to worship and we get to serve him with our lives. But I also want to say here tonight, there might be some of you out there who you know that you're still sent in your sin, even though you know Jesus died for it. And you might have your eyes opened here tonight to see, man, I have never truly been saved, and I'm not living for Jesus Christ. And man, he's that king who's going to come back, and when he comes back, he's going to judge people who are not living for him. Whoa, I need to be saved. I need to trust in him. I need to turn from my sins. If you know that here tonight, in just a minute, I am going to pray. And if you want to talk to somebody, like you know I'm not saved. I think something needs to happen here tonight. And you want to talk to somebody about that? While I pray or while we're singing this worship song, you could grab the friend that brought you or you could just go to the back of the room. There's a whole bunch of people here tonight that would love to talk to you and you can go right out into the cafe and you could have that conversation right away. But if you're like, man, I'm just not sure. I feel like I'm trying to process this. I feel like I have some questions that I'd like to ask. After we sing this worship song, I will come back up and I will break us up into small groups and we'll break up into groups of like two or three people. You can go with the friend that brought you. You can grab a leader. You can have a conversation about what this really means to trust in Jesus. Let me pray.